Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to another distinguished lecture put on by the PMCIS Department of UTT. My name is Kavita Ramnarayan Ramsawak, and I'm a senior lecturer at UTT. And today we have none other than Dr. Asad Mohammed, who will be presenting his distinguished lecture entitled Reforming the System Regulating Built Development in Trinidad and Tobago. We are so proud of the success of our series this far. This is the final lecture for this academic year. So we look forward to having you online interacting with us and even those who are here physically also interacting with us. So I hope you guys enjoy the lecture that is presented to me. I will now welcome the founder of this program, Professor Winston Sweet, to introduce our speaker for today. Colleagues, it is my distinguished pleasure to introduce Dr. Azad Mohammed to give us this closing lecture. I met Azad many years ago, he has gray hair now, he did not then. But he was one of those academics who were involved not only in teaching, but the application of the work as it related to a number of other professions, architecture, planning, engineering, Etc. And I was dabbling myself in a number of these areas. When I look at Azad's brief CV here, I must recall or note one of the ills that take place in academic community. Azad was one of the founding members of the graduate program at UWI going back to 1995 in planning. He was the initiator of that program. And I look, I feel a bit embarrassed today. I could call him Azad, Dr. Azad, Dr. Mohammed, but something does not sound right in that. A person who is as distinguished in, in a spread of fees, would I feel like you will allow me to briefly talk about that? His involvement in disaster preparedness, his involvement in planning, and I believe I should be addressing the goodly gentleman as professor. I consider it one of the, 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 the problems in our local um, academic com community where we do not recognize excellence. So for the rest of the gathering, I will speak of Professor Azad Mohammed, outstanding academic researcher, consultant to the Caribbean region in his area. I see also that he participated in a resilience action plan for the city of Port Spain. And I remember not too long ago when I saw somewhere that the government was interested in making Port of Spain one of the smart cities. So I started to call around a number of people who I felt might be able to give me some information on this issue. What were the terms of reference, who was involved, et cetera. Immediately, as that name came up, I had been reading a little bit 
I was interested in this question of smart spaces. And I think this is one area that Professor Mohammed is an expert in the region in the area of what we now call smart spaces. So we today will have the luxury of listening to a distinguished academic, a professional who has worked throughout the region as a consultant and has diverse areas of competence to share with us. I would not take up his, any more of his time, and I will just invite Professor Azad Mohammed to the podium to deliver what is the fifth and last lecture for this academic year, Dr. Mohammed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Chairman Winston, thanks for the very kind words. Um, you know, you make a decision in this field to do your work or to look for the accolades. I've always chosen to do the work. So I hope that is presented here today. Today, my presentation is on reforming the system regulating built development in Trinidad and Tobago. And you see, I have in sub brackets an overview of the Planning and Facilitation of Development Act 2014, which was amended in 2019. That's particularly so because I feel, as I explained, that much of the requirements for reform of the system resides in this particular act. Now, <clears throat> I want to try and, where possible, and hopefully in the questions, make this issue of reform in the system relevant to a few current issues. One is local government reform. The other one is managing flooding. You hear these two issues coming up all the time when you talk about the built environment and regulating the system and devolution of powers to local government, etc. So as I go along, I'll try and show you where the reform in the system needs to be done to address these issues or <coughs> where it has not addressed the issues, or what is possible or not possible, especially in the area of managing flooding. And also in the end, I also want to talk about some of promoting desired development, because in, we always talk about regulating development as a negative, how to not let this happen, how to make sure you do this, but never about achieving broad issues of good and desired development. So, I want to talk a bit about the historical evolution of the regulatory system, especially the local government. And to suggest to you that what we have in place right now is still predominantly pre-independence. Most of what we have in place is put in place in the pre-independence period. And there have been little, if not zero, actual reform in many areas even though much has been talked about over the years. So prior to 1917, there were municipal ordinances for three cities in Trinidad, Port of Spain, San Fernando, and Arima. And in those municipal ordinances, ordinances, ordinances what is, was done by the Legislative Council in pre-independence Trinidad. There were rules governing built development and layouts and so on just for those three municipalities. In 1917, a public health ordinance was enacted and that was largely rural, dealing with rural areas, including residential layouts and some building activities. This 1917 ordinance was based on a middle 
19th century British uh, public health ordinance. Right? In 1990, parts three and four, the streets and building bylaws, were codified into the Municipal Corporations Act. Now, please note, it was codified into it, but they didn't revoke public health ordinance. So you had parallel jurisdictions in place. And there's a historical evolution of the regulatory system from central government. As you notice, most of the built development of the local government was under these public health ordinances. In 1939, we had a town and country planning ordinance. And you notice that labor riots there. That and the 1939 slum clearance ordinance really didn't come out of any interest of our colonial rulers, masters, to do anything positive in the area. They were forced, their hands were forced because the labor riots that started in Trinidad and spread throughout the region raised the issue of the quality of living of urban masses and poor people. So you had in the urban areas, some planning ordinances and some parents ordinances. And in the rural areas, after the war, you introduced sugar industry labor welfare committees or still within one country throughout the region. So in urban areas, you had planning and housing commissions after World War, the World War II settled and in, and in the rural areas, you had sugar industry labor welfare committees to address this issue that were raised coming out the labor rights. So the, the purpose was not a good intention to improve development. I'm being cynical here. The British reacted to problems that they faced in colonial rule when they introduced these particular laws. In 1942, restriction of urban development. Again, I'll be cynical here. The Americans wanted to be sure they run traffic to their various bases in the country during the war, and they didn't want anybody building along those routes. And that is where that restriction of urban development came. It was not until 1960 that we had, we imported Sir Desmond Heap to draft the town and country planning ordinance. It was an ordinance in 1962. And it was fashioned after the 1947 British Town Planning Act. So I'll show you, even when in 1960 we did that, we went back to the 1947 Act. Now there's some good and bad things about that particular act. And in 1962, when the Housing Act establishing the, uh, the National Housing Authority, the Planning and Housing Commission was split between planning and housing before it was merged. Up to today, in some Caribbean jurisdictions, Guyana Central Planning and Housing Authority, you have planning and housing commissions or the residuals of it in some of the other Caribbean jurisdictions. It goes back to that particular period of time. Labor rights in 1960. But in 1969, the Town and Country Planning Act was finally proclaimed and the division established. In the meantime, there was a division out of the, minister, of the Prime Minister's office that ran planning issues, right? So this was the framework I told you earlier on about local government, regulating building and infrastructure at the local level and regulating town and country planning at the central level. And I would like to suggest to you that this is largely what we have in place right now. A few, um, a few amendments along the way. In 1965, we had the Water and Sewage Authority Act, which centralized water and sewage authority to spread all over the place in municipalities and centralize it. That was an important act that affected wastewater and water supply. And in 1970, the Highways Act, which has very limited application in terms of most built development. It deals with major highways, access to and from major highways, building on the highway reserve, etc. The Highways Act has very little implications for most built development in the country. But the municipal corporation under the Municipal Corporations Act, municipalities and city ordinances are the highways authority within their jurisdiction. 
In other words, whatever jurisdiction exists for major roads and highways throughout the country and the development of those, within municipalities, those powers exist with local authorities. However, you can have in certain jurisdictions within some of these urban areas, roads that pass through them that are under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Woods. So you find this little anomaly where one program is being, one road is being fixed by the local government authority or not being fixed these days. And the other one is being fixed or not being fixed by PIO, a national authority. And the same road branching off in various areas connected to each other will be, will be the jurisdiction of various authorities. Within the overall regulatory authorities, you have some minor agencies which are critical in the approval process fire service, factory inspectorate, and Ministry of Agriculture for the conversion of agricultural lands. Very important, and I'll say, because the cynic will look at the initial, one of the initial purposes of introducing planning in Trinidad, and that was to protect agricultural lands. Not in the sense that we need to protect agricultural lands, in the colonial sense that agriculture was what our function was in the colonial order, and they wanted to make sure that we kept as much land in agriculture as possible. That's a cynical approach, but in fact, is a reality. If you look at top planning acts introduced throughout the region, in fact, we actually see it in the preamble to our act, the preservation of agricultural lands. I want you to know the last point. No drainage statutory requirements. We always talk about the drainage division supposed to do this and supposed to do that and doing this and doing that or not doing this and doing that. There are no statutory requirements defining the operations of the drainage division with respect to built development. Let me repeat that. No statutory requirements requiring the intervention of the drainage division with respect to built development. That may be a surprise to some people. Where the drainage division gets in the act, is where you have major waterways, they set setbacks for build development from their major waterways. How you define major waterways and how you define minor waterways? Somebody needs to explain this to me sometime. I've not seen this clearly defined. I know that major and minor waterways form part of networks, drainage networks within watersheds. I do not all know how to differentiate that and how they relate one power to another one agency and the other one to another agency and how they make sure they interrelate within the operation of a drainage system. I looked up, I've been trying to find where drainage division has statutory powers, malaria, abatement, act, etc., disease, water control. Where the drainage division comes into the picture, it's important, is when matters are referred to them by the local authorities which are the drainage authorities for built development, right? So cities and regional corporations are the drainage infrastructure and roads authorities. And when they go to those authority, they're going there to provide advice on referrals for municipal corporations. So history of a recent history of planning reform. I started in 1983 when Stan. You know, I was a founding director of Susu Lands. That was a kind of assault on the regulatory system. For those of you who are old enough to know about it, those are not. It was a systematic, large scale, open development of land to meet the needs of poor people, trying different rules and regulations on the basis that what was in place was not suiting the needs of the majority of poor people in society and needed to be reformed. I may do things differently now than when we did in 82, 83, when we started this thing. I would do things differently now because I wouldn't perhaps support the low density development in rural areas as part of promoting what is good development. But at the time, we were imbued with the ideas of the limited relevance of some of the inherited colonial laws and the lack of actual specific thought for the requirements of the majority of poor people and that the system was not working for them. And that's where we started Susulan. So I'm saying rather than a public sector reform process, that was reform, attempt to reform from outside 
this is done. The first major since 1969, people working in the division and at municipal authorities were aware that things won't work in the way they should be. But there was no real specific steps. The first real specific step was in 1988 when um, advice was sought from the UN system, kind of nascent UN habitat, not quite UN habitat. And we got two individuals coming on here, Patrick McCoston, who looked at the, the legislative form, and Francis Amos, senior planner in the city of Liverpool at the time when Liverpool was rising out of the uh, underdevelopment and problems in Liverpool. They gave advice to the government of Trinidad and Tobago on both legislative reform and the way to restructure the, the institutions. You notice 1988, two years later, the government changed. I hate to say, whatever advice that was given was paused for a while. 1995, as part of a World Bank conditionality is a package, World Bank, they reviewed both planning legislation and environmental legislation. And out of that came the Environmental Management Authority. The second place, which, which I would call, notwithstanding the good work that is being done and attempts to be done by the EMA, an anomaly in our system. Because prior to that, the environmental review in the British model on the legislative base was largely done by the Town and Country Planning Division under the clause of any other information required to process applications. What this did is set up a parallel institution, as in the US system, called the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, which separated environmental review from planning review in making decisions. Some very important functions about the abatement of pollution and so on were there, but in the regulation of development, it bifurcated the system into two parallel and not integrated systems, which created a problem which in my mind still exists right now. Between 1997 and 2001, um, the inputs that came out of the draft planning legislation of 1995 were taken on board in the drafting of the planning and development of a land bill, which went, to, which went to Parliament on a couple of occasions. It was passed. Some of the mechanisms of the institutional reform was initiated under the Interim National Physical Planning Commission that was supposed to be set up by the legislation. Uh, some of that took place. Winston had the honor to chair that commission. I don't know if you remember that for a while. Again, what is the period of time, 1997 to 2001, that period? Anyone in the audience know what happened after 2001? See a smile in the back there. Change of administration. Legislation. The government imploded upon itself. And didn't make the full circuit. That is why it remains the planning and development of land bill. I was working a couple of years ago in doing a national land use strategy for Nevis, not Nevis and kids. And I was surprised when I read the legislation. It was done by a person who was active in training at the time, their consultant, a lawyer. I said, my God, they have implemented the planning and development of land bill, which at the time was a very advanced bill in the region in St. Kitts. So it had a relevance in other parts of the region as well. Recently, I was down in Suriname and I see remnants of the planning development of land bill and PF bill emerging in Suriname as a planning legislative model. Anyway, unfortunately, again, like I said, as happens in this country, that reform process stalled Many parts of it was carried on in the period 2009-2010 by the Ministry of Local Government. And the Ministry of Local Government undertook a few very important exercises at the time, which is relevant up to today. They undertook 14 municipal development plans, which tried to integrate the planning process with the requirements of the identification of projects, 
for funding and implementation at the municipal level in the planning framework. Before it did not have that. Planning was about land use and local planning was about infrastructure planning. They tried to merge the two into integrated planning process. Those are very good plans that were done in 2009, 2010. And thankfully, in some cases, because I didn't share the National Planning Authority after that, we were able to adopt the quality, those quality plans into the process. Two other things were done in that, in that reform process. Uh, UWI undertook to review and propose what should have been the new, a new process for local planning at the municipal level. It was different from decentralized national planning. It had a completely different purpose. It was not simply about land use and high level agencies. It was also about meeting the requirements in a plan framework for the identification and implementation of infrastructure projects as well at the municipal level. And in um, the, that process was done and there were local economic profiling done to contextualize planning and development within the socioeconomic context profiles of the municipalities. So good work was done onto that particular process there. And in 2014, the Planning and Facilitation and Development Act was passed and partially proclaimed. Two elements of it were proclaimed. One, the element allowed the establishment of the institutional structures. And second, one, to allow the implementation and development of what called development orders, which is a means by which development standards are done. There were, in 1919, that piece of legislation that was passed in 2014 was brought back to the parliament. And um, I would like to suggest there were 16 or so amendments, inconsequential minor amendments in 2019 of a piece of legislation that was passed in 2014, five years before that. Now, so let me talk a bit about this piece of legislation the 2014 Act amended 2019. This act is more than a successor to the Town and Country Planning Act of 1969. It does revise and update the land use planning framework, which is accumulation of a process of some 35 years going ongoing. I'll give you some of the history of that reform that was attempted. Going back to review of the initial 1969 Act, the 1988 review of the legislation by McCausland. It does it brings in a, a, a process that is about 35 years old in form of that. But what it also does, it integrates at the national level regulation of building and development and public health issues that were previously found in the public health ordinance and the 1990 Municipal Corporation Act. Because right now, as it exists in law right now, there's a national planning authority for the building and infrastructure authority, except for major highways and major rivers of municipal authorities. They are the building authority. Like I said, most matters are referred for advice. So for example, the chief designs engineer, Winston, has no statutory power all the power the chief designs is here to talk about structural integrity and, um, and seismic risk and so on. They give that advice on a referral from the municipal planning authority, which is still the building authority. The same thing with most drainage matters. When they get a matter referred to them, they get advice on that. And the highways division gives advice on the layouts within subdivisions. They don't have any statutory authority to do that. We think, when we enter the process or development goes in the process that you must do meet those agencies, no. Those matters, decisions can be made if the technical capacity existed at the municipal level, they have the statutory power to make decisions. And there is no statutory oversight of it from the central government, not, not necessarily. 
right? So a minister of works in JG's division, highway division, etc., building branch can only give advice, he cannot override and tell those authorities what to do or not. I'm actually a little surprised recently when I see that the Ministry of Local Government is taking action to say they will take action against drainage infringements. Now, enforcement under the Municipal Corporations Act of 1990 is very weak. This act tries to address some of those, but the Minister of Local Government, I'd like to see where the powers exist for the Minister of Local Government or the Drainage Division to go in and deal with minor drains and take enforcement action. I do not know that it's a statutory. Of course, I'd like to be proven wrong because, of course, enforcement needs to be done. What is important about this 19, uh, 19 Amendment, uh, 2014 legislation, it revokes parts three and four of the public health ordinance when those parts of the act are proclaimed. What does that mean? If you are in development and you find yourself going to municipal corporations, very often you find yourself caught between the building inspectorate and the public health inspectorate because the one jurisdiction continued from 1919 and the other one was established in um, 1990 but it has not been sorted out clearly. So you have continuing jurisdictions from the past because the legislative powers were not cleared up. So this particular legislation defines what the role of public health is in the building area and what the role of the municipal um, inspectorate is with respect to building matters. So that's one of the things that this 1990, 1914, 20, well, mix it up, 2024 Planning Facilitation of Development Act amended in 1919 does. I'll get back a bit to that particular point there in a while, but under the Town and Country Planning Act, for example, there's no division. There's no statute establishing the Town and Country Planning Division. The Act names a minister. So theoretically, the minister could get up in the morning over his coffee or doing something else when you do in the morning, sit them with a set of files and approve or not approve files. The minister is the one who has the power on the act and he reports to it. The town and country plan division is an administrative arrangement. The alter ego of the minister, right? So very often you see decisions assigned on behalf of the minister. And then what happens? It goes back to the minister. You appeal. The minister makes a decision. You send it back to the minister to reconsider his decision on appeal. Right? Okay, I'll deal with that in a little while. Now, this act establishes two very important committees. One is the Development Control Committee, and the other one is the Codes and Standards Committee. Anybody who's been involved, and there have been many attempts to try and look at the development of codes and standards, it's an ad hoc procedure. Sometimes done. In the past, I've been involved in exercises done by the Minister of Woods, sometimes the Minister with respect to housing and urban development, but there is no statutory authority for the establishment of those codes and standards. So he does not reside in the Minister of Woods. He has no authority other than the areas I define with respect to highways and major drains. The building branch does not have authority. So this establishes a mechanism that the responsibility of that committee is to keep, to bring into place and keep updated codes and standards affecting the development in the country. That's what the Development Control Committee is, right? No longer theoretically is it a discretion of our sub or drainage division to develop standards, keep it in a file in the office and say this is the policy we change it. They have, to, they have to codify those things and bring it to this codes and standards committee and see what the policy is for doing this and what the standards are. So there's a statutory mechanism under this act to ensure it wouldn't happen all in one shot, but there's a systematic process for the development of codes and standards. And in fact, even before the legislation 
When after the legislation was proclaimed in 2014, the jurisdiction for the codes and standards committee was passed the National Planning Task Force for initiation and continuation in an interim measure in 2014. It also sets up what is called the Development Control Committee. I'll talk a bit about that, all right, in a little while. But right now, we have under the Municipal Corporations Act, a committee which is called the Coordinating Committee at Municipal Authorities. It's an informal committee where municipalities call the various agencies and talk about what they should do. But there's no statutory mechanism to, to bring to, together various agencies, talk how they relate to each other and how they impact upon major development, right? And how you facilitate and fast track the process of implementation of development. Around 20, around 2009 to 2011, the International Finance Committee did a process mapping of what it took and how much time and what are the obstacles in all the agencies involved in the regulation of development. They didn't do it for the planning process, they did it for the Ministry of Trade at the ease of doing business, but it was very useful. I won't tell you what the results are, it was not quite what you think about where the major impediments are, I'll raise some of those issues. And then it names three technical divisions, a director of planning, the head of planning division, a statutory director, and a chief building official, for the first time, at the national level, a technical oversight mechanism coordinating the various technical functions that are done at the municipal level is established. And it, I think it is envisaged that some of the technical capacity is established in the building branch and some in the drainage division and some in the highways division that are now referred to will be embedded in this chief building officials establishment to provide national level guidance and oversight of those functions at the municipal level. And it establishes a national, a multi-stakeholder national planning authority to do something which in many jurisdictions, and here we talked about, to depoliticize the planning process a bit more. So yes, the minister has very important roles, but his role is diminished with respect to making planning decisions or regulatory decisions. And when the minister intervenes and the minister can intervene, when it is a matter of national importance involving a foreign country or something like that, the minister must gazette their decision. In other words, they can't intervene arbitrarily. They must gazette and say why they intervene and what the outcome was. So that leaves a very important role for the minister, policy directions, taking plans to parliament, et cetera, and the ability to intervene, but in a technical, non-politicized manner. So what are the changes in the planning framework? We have a, we've only passed three statutory plans in history. Notwithstanding the division did some 40 something plans prior to 1990, 1995. Only three statutory plans, a national physical development plan, plan for Port of Spain and by development order plan for Shadaramas. There are no other statutory plans. The basis for guiding land use decisions should not be ad hoc or policy that nobody knows about. It should be a planning framework that is discussed, consulted and passed in the parliament. We always hear, I remember Professor Kenny used to complain when, when he smelled that the discussion was going on. He said, this is not part of the not in the National Physical Development Plan. How could it be? The National Physical Plan, plan is strategic. It's about broad national goals, broad areas. It is not a useful framework. It has never been for making land use decisions at the local or site level. It can't be. It is a strategic plan. The new act suggests that the national plan is a, is a strategic plan. And they replace the National Physical Development Plan with a national spatial development strategy, which is more policy than plan. And then it says the action for decision-making will be done at municipal level plans and further down at local area action plans. And municipal authorities, for the first time, 
are granted the powers to do development plans. They can't right now. You could evolve some development control powers under the decision makers from the national level to municipalities, even though it has never been done. But right now, the new act gives the ability of not the local authorities to do plans. Of course, the plans must be in conformity with the National Spatial Development Strategy, and it must follow a particular guideline for inclusion of stakeholders and discussion, participation in the process. And once it does that, those plans don't have to go to Parliament. So those 40 plans that were done before, 42 plans, I think, those can be implemented for decision-making once certain conditions are not in place. If you have to acquire lands from people, compulsory acquisition of lands for planning purposes, it must go to Parliament because that is a constitutional right that people's property can't be taken without a due process including a Parliament decision. So what are the changes in development control? Well, simple, simple subdivisions and simple buildings the powers that evolve to local authorities. And in the first instance, those are defined as subdivisions under 19 parcels and buildings under 5,000 square feet. But even those that evolve to municipal authorities, but even among those, if the subdivision is in an area, like a steep land or in an area with geological problems or so, that may require a CEC under the EM Act, then they have to be referred back up. So a municipality may not have a technical decision. It could still refer matters up, either simple planning decisions or simple buildings. If they feel that there's some complexity or it requires a CEC, they can refer those back up to the national authority for advice. But all applications going first to the municipal authority, because that's where the final approval comes. If they require they go up to the national level, they come back down, and then the approvals are issued for the municipal authority. The chief building official has a power now which does not exist. There is no equivalent national authority. They are supposed to oversight the functioning, and they have the powers to call up development or issues which are confronted either in the community or so that they feel are not being handled, they have the power to intervene, but they must give a reason why not. Why? And then finally, the Act introduces a registered professional regime. Our, our lead colleague, Frederick Bifu Vincent, had moved to the regional governments and insisted that building structures have an engineer sign it. I think you all may aware of that, right? That's not that people can go for judicial review of that. There's no law that makes them able to do that. There's no law. It was, a, it was an arrangement and it is dealt with as if it's a law. But in the new legislation, there's the idea of introducing registered professional regime to deal with the issue of the fact that we have limited professionals available, either in the municipality to review the matters. So if you come there and you're a structural engineer or a drainage engineer and you introduce a plan, you stamp it, you sign it, and you test the fact that it's in conformity with the plans as you know it, it can go through the system. And what you could do is you could have quality assurance. The municipalities can do what they could say, I will randomly select X amount for detailed tests. So every plan introduced potentially can be checked, but those that stand can go through. So you don't know whether your plan will be or not. And if you are found to be derelict or introducing something that is not so, then you are sent back to your professional body for ethical review for your license to operate, right? So the checks and balances in the system. So the registered professional regime, I'll tell you another benefit of it. In this proposed system, can play a role so municipal authorities don't have to have all the expertise on hand to do it. And then what was introduced in legislation was something which was gotten from, from Ontario. And that is 
the municipalities themselves can establish a panel of reviewers. And those people can review a plan once they attest that they have no financial or other interest in a plan that they review. So they can use professional professionals on both sides of the regime. Now it says the planning and facilitation of development. There's some very specific mechanisms. One is initiation of accelerated construction. You know, the time Shelley takes so long, you're gonna lose the rainy season. You can post a bond and initiate construction while you're waiting for the approval. Of course, when the approval process say, is okay, okay, when the process finds a problem, you have to go in and rem remedy it. But a bond is posted to make sure you, you have a financial stake in protecting it. The legislation also provides a statutory coordination between the CEC process and the EIA process with the EME. Right now, uh, let us explain what the CEC process is. A certificate of environmental clearance is required for a list of designated activities under the EM Act. Factors that could cause pollution, environmental problems, traffic, noise, whatever it is, either during the planning or during the construction. And sometimes it may or may not require EIA. Big projects would may require EIA. But here it is. You can get a CEC, and it doesn't necessarily mean you get planning for approval. It is not guaranteed. Right now, the way it works is the, the, the planning authority, if it requires a CEC, tells you, go and get your, your the CEC first, and what they require. And then you come back here. But the CECs and the EMA's responsibility is not to deal with all the requirements for approving build development or land use changes. So they may still require, and there's a possibility you have to do two different EIAs with different specifications for different purposes. There's a clause in the new act which requires that those two activities be coordinated and the planning authority has the overall say. And if in a development plan, there's appropriate write-off for the environmental considerations in a local area development plan. And then environmental concerns are taken on board in establishing the land use. You do not require CEC for a land use decision. You may still require it for the operations or the excavation or during the construction process to make sure you don't create pollution or noise abatement or nuisance in the community. You may still need it, but not for the land use decision. Again, the registered professional regime facilitates the process of uh, acceleration of good development. Good development in terms of achieving national development objectives, meeting existing standards and regimes, and so on. Now, there's a biggie. There is an Office of Enforcement at the National Planning Authority whose responsibility is to enforce and the powers of municipal authorities are enhanced right now. They can give a show cause. The, the powers are very weak. Eventually, they have to take it to the magistrate's court. And colleagues and developers know how to, to spin that around. You, you're building occupied and you're renting it out and you're, you're surviving the economic life of your building before you make any changes or amendments. If you go around UE, you will see a lot of those professors, those types of developers. No parking, inadequate parking, whatever it is, they get away with it. Height violations, density violations, all kinds of things. They can get away with it because they could spin the enforcement process in the magistrates caught long enough to recover their money. And after that, they'll fight up and make some amendments. Right now, the municipal authority can issue stop notices and they can issue environmental repair notices. They still have access to the courts. But all this talk about no enforcement of people building in the water courses and blocking drains and so on, 
one building inspector sometimes for area the size of the large one Sandy Grandi or our areas populous as to the Puna Piaco, right? Or area that's complex building in Port of Spain. You have one building inspector with some assistance. How can those people? Very often those municipal corporations don't get the engineers. When they get an engineer, what type of engineer they get? I don't want to decry anybody, I've dealt with good ones. No, no, no. The person who accept the job as a municipal engineer in a corporation is a junior engineer. Right? No senior engineer taking that job is not paid enough. There's no status in that job. They have to go around and help it in this one and so on. Minor good fits. So you get junior engineers when you do have engineers. Very often they didn't have engineers in most of them. So the ability to enforce, to monitor the amount of development taking place, right? And to regulate it and enforce weak enforcement through Madrid's court and so on is, I mean, I'm happy if the Minister of Local Government found ways to enforce against drainage infringements within the powers of municipal authorities. But right now, it's a mess. This act, when it's implemented, provides some mechanism, hopefully, to achieve that. The Development Control Committee has spent a little bit of time. It's not a one-stop shop. It's not intended to go there. It is really intended to coordinate the system. Occasional large projects, you will not have standards. How often we build an airport? How often we build a port? How often we build a smelter plant? Right? Those types of development, you need to take it to, you can't send it around. Those, author those authorities have never dealt with one before. Therefore, they don't have the in house capacity. You bring it there. When I was chairman of the National Fiscal, Interim National Fiscal Planning Commission, they sent the five stadiums which they wanted accelerated construction on, and we were able to fast track those. And I was on the board of the EMA when the CC rules were introduced, and we raised the fee from $100,000 TT dollars to $100,000 US dollars, because we had no expertise at that time if a smelter plant came for review of an EIA, even to specify what was required. In those cases, we may need to even go outside of the national jurisdiction and get international best practice or technical capacity to help us. There's no reason to believe that small countries can establish the technical capacity to review complex one-off type projects, once in a generation type projects, right? So it coordinates and degrade the regulatory process it facil facilitation and introduction of regulation and standards to move away from ad hoc policies and standards into a regime of standards and complex one-time types of development. The Codes and Standards Committee, I said, moving away from the Ministry of Works and Transport doesn't mean the Ministry of Works and Transport will not have a role and its agency will not have a role, but right now they don't have a statutory power to do it. And the TTBS, for example, the small building guide, which they are the ones who have kept that going, um, and other things. Yes, after the codes and standards are developed, it could be sanctioned by this. There is no need to go to the TTBS. The TTBS does not have the technical capacity to deal with complex engineering and planning related codes and standards. They have they are other types of standards. So you create an organization which can does that and it covers all standards involved in the development process. You heard right now, you go to the minister, the minister makes a decision, you go back to the minister. This establishes a statutory process. Convened by the Environmental Commission, because they, you don't want to replicate too much cause, but a special division to deal with building matters, a special division to deal with land use matters, et cetera. And I realize I'm taking that and I'll be closing quickly. Um, technical decisions are final. You could go to the court on the basis of procedural matters. And it is, this legislation establishes third party rights. The EM Act has third party rights. Wayne Kublasi could go to the Environmental Commission. She did it at the Smelter plant, right? But he had nowhere to go other than environmental issues on land use decisions. A community 
upset by the establishment of a ratchet band. Very common issue in the community creating dust and noise or drugs. For a type of development, there was a controversy which could have been sorted out in um, Twin City, Balkansky development. There will be a statutory third party court to go and raise your points and they will be with that matter technically. It's not an arbitrary process. So, local government reform. Elements exist in, since 2014 with respect to municipality, the regulation, the development, and I told you the devolution of powers. Uh, 2014 local government coordinating committee made detailed recommendations on the structure and requirements of municipal planning authorities. And 2015, worked out the procedures for the formal devolution of powers which already exist under the THA Act. You see the times I'm telling you about? 2014 and 2015, when the present local government reform process was started, all this information was made available to the then Minister Frankie Kahn. What year are we in? Nine years after. I'm told, thankfully, that the PFD is an important part of local government reform. I hope it is. I had a presentation from the chairman of the National Planning Authority, Dr. Armstrong, which he's talking about steps being put in place to start the process in my mind of implementation. I'm not, I, I will not use the word implement. I do not know what the time frame could be. It seemed to me they were still early steps, maybe going over and checking what that had been done sometime before. But I sincerely hope that the powers I told you, which can really strengthen the ability of local government, are put in place. I just want to say a few words on this. Because I hear a lot of talk about local government reform and flood management. I hear a lot of arguments between the minister and chairman of corporations and so on about it. I know that you can't pull a drain out of a network. You can't deal with one river on its own. You have to start at the top and you have to go to the outfall in the river. I knew that few municipalities or few local areas have full watersheds in their jurisdiction. So what therefore is the appropriate rule between watershed management and water management and the planning for those and the methods are needed and the functions of the drainage division and municipal authorities. Obviously to me, the leadership has to come from the national level. We have to have a watershed management plans. I helped the OECS a few years ago develop the, the, the methodology for national and local area planning. And one of the recommendations which they accepted was the definition of boundaries of local areas should as far as possible be impacted by local area watersheds because it's such an important aspect of it. We have a problem the way we've defined planning jurisdictions, the way we've defined municipal jurisdictions. They may have very good rational constituent numbers and so on and do, for those boundaries, but they don't do very well to meet the requirements for the planning and management of build development and issues like flooding and water management. Don't do a very good job. But we need to rethink that. We need to maybe have a parallel framework that addresses those. In the, the new act, there's an agreement of planning arrangements between municipalities which will facilitate that. And um, so municipal authorities have limited capacity that obviously a national authority requirement, but of course related to the functioning and requirements of local area. And then we need to think about building a land use adaptation to flood risk. Long ago when we were doing a Kappa River Basin study and you went in there, people know they were getting flooded two, three times a year, even the chicken cobs. On stills. Nowadays, people are not building on stills. They know 
in a flood-proof area. They know they're going to get flooded three times a year, and they go and they fill out downstairs. Long ago, the floods will come and go, and they will survive it. I said the chicken cooks on it. So there's need for rethinking some of the approaches and standards to how we build and how we adapt land use to flood. I just want to say a few things, because this is a critical topic up to yesterday and throughout the country when you talk about regulation development, but some of the tools we have need to be thought in terms of the balance between national and local among the land. So I haven't talked a bit about it, but in the policy standards and plans that we have, that's where we get a chance to look at climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, resilience planning. It come up very much in the resilience plan for Port of Spain, place making community space and resources, energy are, are linking up to some of the things in the last two lectures from Ray and so on, right? Energy efficiency and walkability. I know Trevor talked about some of these issues. Highway development versus improved accessibility and connectivity, location of land use services and schools, public transit, improve existing road networks. Why is that part of discourse and planning? We, we have a highway building discourse, and we have a transit planners discourse and then and a land use discourse. We don't have an integration of those. And of course, we need new policies and standards to implement some of these things. I understand there's a hillside policy. I haven't seen it. I've been trying to get it for the resilience plan for Port of Spain. We weren't able to get it as yet. I understand it's still being reviewed in the ministry. I understand the Ministry of Public Utilities is now having a, a water harvesting process of buildings. Those things could be included. These are the types of policies and standards we need to move beyond the negative approach to regulating development, to trying to promote good sound development that we need. Thank you very much. Okay, so we want to thank Dr. Mohammed for that very enlightening lecture. At this time, we'll be having some questions. So those of you who are on virtually, ask you to share your question with us. Um, <clears throat> we have one question from our last presenter, Dr. Trevor Townsend. And he asked, why can't they contract engineering services to help with quality assurance and enforcement. So I'm thinking he's talking about the local government, right? And, and if I could answer Trevor's question, I mentioned that the municipal authorities, when they have limited capacities, can create panels and contract it to help them to meet shortfall in the review capacity. That is envisioned in the legislation. They also have to do the professional attestation, and that is to demonstrate that they don't have any conflict of interest. But what, what, what is envisaged is that you may have a few professionals who are working in a particular locality because each locality would have its own peculiarities, soil types, drainage issues, um, existing build development, road networks, etc. And people who are familiar with that would better be able to advise the corporations. So you may want to create a panel with a retainer and you call them in and you pay them for the services to do it. And I said, we had used a model out of Ontario, which had worked for developing that. So that is a real possibility. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. So we seem to have a good plan because the proposals that you prepare or, or present us today seem to be very um, systematic. What is the problem? of implementation? Is it because we are depending on um, the politicians to drive the process? Do we need the politicians to drive the process? Because I have a question following that when I have to say yes or no. Let me be very careful of how I answer the question. I was at the opening of a project with Habitat for Humanity and the Minister of Local Government told me very specifically Planning and Facilitation Development Act is an important part of local government reform. Right? Yeah. I take him at his word, and I hope that there's accelerated interest in the implementation of this and the full proclamation of the parts of this legislation 
especially the many useful parts with local government. So I hope if it doesn't happen right now, it happens in the near future. And I told you I was encouraged that the last year, the National Planning Authority was finally appointed with the critical stakeholders and members. And we had a presentation a couple months ago by Dr. Armstrong on the process of starting the implementation process. So those are two positive signs, but I will tell you that that I know of, because I was involved in that process, I chaired National Planning Authority and Task Force on the Local Coordinating Committee for Local Government, that a tremendous amount of the preparatory, necessary preparatory work, costing and so on, including cabinet decisions, were done as early as 2014. And I don't know why it has taken this long to bring it to fruition. Maybe we need a political hype around local government reform to bring it to the fore. A more of a question, more of a comment with that matter, because I was waiting for that answer that you were telling me about. But I just want to add a comment, and maybe you can agree or not, but I want to believe that these reforms are not sexy enough for elections. In the sense that when a government or a prime minister appoints a minister, you hear about Ministry of Works, you hear about education and health, right? Those are the big ticket items. But planning a local government doesn't win you an election. And sometimes the prime ministers are concerned with winning the election. And I've always found that we have good systems in place because as we know, Dr. Mama, we know each other from long. I've always seen that progress has taken place faster than we can actually um, plan for the progression. So I, 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 I agree with you. Yeah. Planning, planning, it perceives theoretically planning at the high level, at the national level, socioeconomic and development planning and innovation and so on, does not seem to affect people on the ground. Yeah. But many of the issues in terms of local government reform in this bill strengthen the ability of local government to understand and provide services would allow, when you look at the TV these days and interviewing people, half the people complaining about very basic things which need to be done, which some of this legislation will help. So I don't know whether it is, is not sexy enough, but maybe it doesn't seem as if local government is not an important element, except when have a local government election. So maybe I don't know what it is, but I, I'm just concerned it hasn't, there's not enough drive action. In the action. <laughs> to just add a sentence, um, some of us might remember when in the not too distant past, the AG was moved from being the AG and put in charge of what people call box trains. And it was considered even recently this week, I heard somebody using the term that he was demoted to box trains. That was considered a demotion and not a promotion. When you obey that as it may, it reflects what my colleague is saying. Well, I mean, Winston, you have to take it as positive that the minister said, no, he considered it an opportunity for him to do work. So hopefully he has a drive anywhere at all to take the agenda forward. The, the, the next question I want to um, ask or comment on. Uh, we both would have been 40 years ago, 40 years ago, involved in the question of professional registration. And at that time, this is 19, is it 80s, 1990, somewhere there, and there was a big conference in, in, in um, but I could go further back. When I was chairman of APET in 1985, we were struggling I had taken up the, 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 the thing from Fenwick to get registration, compulsory registration of engineers. This is 1985. We, we, we finally got registration of a sort. And around the same time, architects were trying to get compulsory registration for architects. Do the planners in Trinidad have compulsory registration? 
I didn't talk about it at all in this presentation. When the legislation was passed, it required under the registered professional regime, people registered by the Board of Engineering, yes. the Land Survey Board, and the Institute of Architects, and professional members of the Trinidad and Tobago Society of Planners. At the same time, legislation with draft legislation was paired on the Urban and Regional Planners Professional uh, Act. And that has subsequently been passed, which um, in an amended form, which requires compulsory registration for planners. I could share with you, there was a discussion on how you go about with, with the JCC and how you're about determining which is the registered professional you need for which activity. And there's of course an issue between uh, project manager who is an engineer and a project manager who is an architect signing off on a complex building that has requires a structural engineer to sign off on or a civil engineer that they have some experience signing off on a development that has a complex drainage system. So the idea was to start with first a first range of registered professionals, a planner for a large subdivision to make sure he has a land surveyor on the cadastral and topographic information, a civil engineer on the, on the infrastructure system, and gradually in agreement with the professional bodies to specify the types of activities and the types of qualification according to the professional associations that could sign as a registered professional. You have to have different criteria, but it is up to the professional associations to provide those lists of people, not the state. Yeah. Why I raise this is because recently the engineers have started grumbling again. When, when, I, when we passed a, a bill of sorts, an act in the parliament in 1985, like I said, I was the president of our taking the thing, 10 years after, at the anniversary of that, I wrote a short note uh, pointing out that in fact we had been jigged, that we, we didn't have compulsory registration. What we got was optional registration. So those who wanted to register could register, those who don't want to register could have the same in that. Okay, talk, yeah, there, there is under this, under this particular Planning and Facilitation Development Act, there is no need for compulsory registration. However, you cannot submit a complex plan or a complex building design unless you are registered, right? So uh, no longer can somebody claiming to be an architect or somebody who say they are planner or so, who say they are surveyor submit it anymore. They could submit simple, development. But if you want to submit a complex one, you have to be registered under one of the categories of those registration acts. Well, I saw, I saw, in a sense, I, I, I sort of come back on the issue 40 years after, is because, in fact, we did not get compulsory registration. And I wondered if, if engineers got the option to register or not to option. Architects, I don't know if they did get compulsory registration. I don't think so. Um, I do not have, I was asking about planners and surveyors. No. Now, something that, that you raised suggested that we may need to do like what the doctors have. The medical doctors went through an elaborate exercise, I'm aware of the while they were going through it, of registration of specialists so that not only do you have your MBBS as a basic degree, but that to be called a specialist. This is the this medical is, association this is envisioned. has set up yeah, and they, have a, they got legislation passed. No, this is envisaged that categories of 
categories of buildings, for example. So a civil engineer could submit a plan for a building up to certain dimensions. Above a certain amount, you have to have a specialization endorsed by the Board of Engineering that you are a structural engineer to do that. The same thing with a civil engineer can introduce a, a subdivision, but if you have a complex drainage issue in it, you have to have, or you have complex soils issues, then you have to have another type of engineer with specialist qualifications. I know. Why, why I raise this thing, and I think it is very, very important, the issue my colleague raised on. What, what you raised here, in a sense, is, is it goes back, as I said, to, to, to 1985. In fact, before that, when Fenwick and I was trying to get, they were trying to get compulsory edition in 19, 1960, 60 something, before I was even an engineer. And um, when Fenwick passed on the, the thing in 1980, 80 something to the younger engineers, we took up that mantle. And um, in a sense, what you are saying, there's need for compulsory registration and specialization and some, as the medical doctors have. What I will tell you is this. And, and one second, and the lawyers, not only lawyers, are possibly, they and the accountants are, I think, the only two professionals who have to register. And if they don't pay their dues, they are struck off for one year. What I would say is this. When I was chairman of the National International Fiscal Planning Commission, when the planning and facilitation, no planning and development of land bill, 1997 to 2000, which is the predecessor to this, I had the, the privilege of having Fenwick and Brian on the committee, right? And Fenwick was the deputy chairman, and they were very strong on the issue of professional registration and professional requirements and the role of the professional. As you know, Fenwick championed that. So Fenwick was the deputy chairman and we, we had that, that quality of expertise available to us. Right? Brian Lewis and Fenwick before. We also had Molly Gaskin on the environment. I mean, I'll give you an idea of the kind of people we had in the, in the plan development of land bills. Kavita, you'd have to tell me because you're, you're not with yeah, any yeah, questions. Yeah, a, a famous person, I keep forgetting his name. He was one of the first civil engineers and planners. He worked in, with Kendrick um, on Point Lisas. Ah, Ken Snags. Ken Snags. Yeah. When I sat at these few feet, I learned, in other words, the importance mm -hmm. as a civil engineer. To, to, to start to see the importance of understanding your field planning. Well, I told you, you know I'm lucky in the sense that I listened to my father who was the first director of engineer, yeah. director of drainage talk about these types of issues growing up. Kavita, you had any questions for me? Yeah. Yes, so I have one comment from Mr. Kerry Pariyal. He's actually one of our past UTD students who works um, in the Ministry of Planning. He says, when the councils of the local authority are not aware of their function and further rely on their burgesses to put them in place, they assume gun-shy positioning with respect to enforcement at the local level. Presumably, this situation will not change under the new legislation, does it? Um, the, what, what is different under the new legislation, if I could take Kerry, I saw Kerry made some comments on low hanging fruit as well. <laughs> One of the things which I think may be useful is there, are, there is oversight of some of the foundation. It doesn't take over, but it's oversight of the, the building and infrastructure functions of the local authority, which they are the authority right now for both approval and enforcement by the chief building official. Right now, there is no counterpart national authority to help them and support them. Technically, they have to go to individual agencies. So that may help. And then there are third party rights established under the legislation, which means that somebody could complain 
to the Environmental Commission or the Planning Commission on Development taking place. And they have to be listened to because the rights of a party. Right now, the two parties are the applicant and the state, except under the EM legislation. This establishes three parties, the applicant, the state, and any third party affected within timeframes, of course, in terms of approving development. So there are some mechanisms in it. The legislation, of course, does not try to correct the many issues and problems in the management and implementation of local government generally. It really focuses on the regulation and development of built development, right? So that's where the focus is. So yes, it cannot solve the larger problems, but there are mechanisms around the regulation of built development. We also had some more comments from Dr. Townsend. He says the problem is that elected politicians require low hanging fruit so that they can tout it as a success. These strategic planning matters require medium to long term vision and action. And then Kerry responded, have you ever have you ever observed what happens to unpicked high hanging? Well, what I would say is this, this is an issue. That I told you that it took a lot to get the partnership, I'm not a lot, we got the partnership government except the 20, 2009, 2010 municipal plans and processes. Because I was involved in working them and I became chair, I was able to convince them to accept those, right? In 1997, when I was put on a committee to review the existing legislation, we were able to take on board the work that had been done by the 1995 committee, because I sat on that representing the Society of Planners and I knew that good work was done. So I was personally able to try and intervene. But unless you have that happening, Fenwick Defoe is somebody as well, who, the late Fenwick Defoe, who managed to help me to bridge at jurisdictions and administrations. But unless you have people who are able to do that, sometimes a lot falls between the cracks in terms of administration for one reason or the other. One reason or the other. Even when you change a minister, I remember on the Susulan's issue on housing, there was more in common between, a, not a court name, let me call it <laughs> between Sadiq Baksh after they made him instead of Johnny Minister of Housing and Danny Montano. Between administrations, then they were between Humphrey and Baksh. So even within administrations, when you change a minister and the minister brings in a, a new advisor or they have a new PS, PS is a very strong people, you could find even in administrations, discontinuity of policy, right? So you have that within and then you have between administrations, obviously, they want to take, some of it is they want to take a good hard look, like if you've been looking at this PFT for nine years now, they want to take a good hard look at a new piece of legislation. They want to amend it. Some of it is that, and some of it is, well, I would put my own stamp on it. 16 minor, 16 minor amendments in 2019, five years after 2014. Okay, let's move forward with it then. So um, we'll so we'll end um, our questions at this point, and I'd like to invite Dr. Chinchami for closing remarks to the lecture. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Yeah. Right. So good afternoon, everyone. So they say if you're planning for a year. You sow rice. If you're planning for a decade, you plant trees. When you're planning for a lifetime, you educate people. Do you get where I'm coming from? Yes. <laughs> so we have been doing that over the last few months. And today's presentation is the icing on the cake. You would have seen that as presentation put together a lot of the discussions that have taken place over the last four to five months, and possibly over the last academic year. On behalf of UTT, on behalf of my department that I lead, I want to sincerely thank Dr. Mohammed 
the relationship Dr. Mohammed and I have way, way back to 1998 as a student in his fundamental of land development class. And I've never forget those days until later on he became the head of the Department of Surveying and Land Information. A lot of the traits and a lot of the, uh, the management skills that I have ex uh, expressed as a head of department came probably from the former heads of the department and, I, and all the accolades we have mentioned today. We, we forget to mention Dr. Mohammed also led that unit. I was a student at the time and later on a postgraduate student. So I want to thank him for the not only knowledge that he imparted today for me, the audience here and the wider community. But that level of knowledge that you have imparted on us surveying students and graduates over the years. Thank you very much. At this time, we'd like to welcome Dr. Mohammed back to the lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Mohammed, on behalf of our PNCS department, and the ETT team, we'd like to thank you for your enlightening lecture. And thank you for taking time off of your busy schedule. I know you were really busy, but you took the time to educate us and enlighten us. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, now we'll have a vote of thanks by Ms. Nina. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Project Management Civil Infrastructure Systems Unit at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, we'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Asad Mohammed for his insightful presentation. Your expertise and knowledge in this field have greatly enriched our understanding of the subject matter. We'd also like to express our sincere appreciation to the various departments of ETT who contributed to the continued success of the Distinguished Lecture Series. The efforts of the Corporate Communications, Outreach, Industrial Relations, Campus Management, AP, Multimedia, and IT Department were instrumental in ensuring a seamless and engaging event. We'd like to extend our gratitude to the audience who attended the lecture in person, as well as those who joined us remotely via Zoom and YouTube. Your presence and active participation added immense value and to the discussion. We greatly appreciate your continued support and interaction. Lastly, we would like to announce that the next Distinguished Lecture is scheduled for September 27th. We encourage everyone to stay tuned for further information and updates regarding this upcoming event. Thank you again and it's